All right, let's begin. Welcome to CS 2050. Uh, the topic of today is RSA cryptography. So um, the number theory, this is the final lecture on the number theory unit. Number theory, again, a beautiful science. Um, Warren Hardy, this uh, British guy, he loved number theory during World War I because it was totally unapplied. It was for two millennia, number theory was totally like a recreational act. It didn't really help you do anything. It was just kind of interesting that all numbers happened to have these properties. It didn't help you build missile guidance systems or anything like this. It was just sort of totally um, for fun, but it still allows you to think critically. And number theory went up unapplied really for two millennia until like the 1970s when three guys, Rivest, uh, Shamir, and Edelman figured out a way to apply it. So unfortunately now we use number theory is now an applied science, so his, his, Warren Hardy's dream is dead. But RSA is so important, it's basically how everything in the internet works securely. It's probably up there the greatest invention of the 20th century besides the internet because it enables all secure communication. Even today, every, every time you use HTTPS on a website, every single time it's still doing RSA, um, uh, even today. So what is cryptography, first of all? Cryptography is sort of a science of secrecy. You have what we'll call a model. So you have two players. You have Alice, and then you have Bob. And they want to communicate uh, secretly. So what they do is they send messages to each other, M1, M2, something like this. Um, and there's a third guy named Charlie. This is Alice. Charlie is a bad guy. He's some sort of bad actor. Uh, and Charlie has a, 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 an eavesdropping power, which is he can listen to all the messages that Alan, Alice and Bob sent to each other. This models many different uh, schemes. For example, um, Alice, I mean, excuse me, Charlie could literally be the government opening up paper envelopes and reading them and then gluing them back together. Uh, sometimes... Uh, uh, Charlie could be like an intermediary mail server node that hops a message across, and then from there a message is copied and read. Uh, Charlie could be like a man in the middle. It could be like an ISP or something. You know, even if there's no computer, even if Alice and Bob talk over a direct line, like a completely direct wire with nothing breaking them, you can still take a multimeter and put it on the wire, and then measure the beeps and boops, and then you'll get the message back out. So. Internet communication generically is very open. I mean, you send them, you send those packets out there. There's really nothing stopping you, stopping someone from reading it. So, Alice and Bob need the ability to communicate privately. So they'll start with something we'll, we'll call it a symmetric encryption scheme. Symmetric encryption scheme. A symmetric encryption scheme is a tuple of three algorithms. We'll call it G, E, and D. And we'll, the G is some algorithm which takes as input some randomness, and it outputs um, a key k. And k, and this is called symmetric encryption because um, they both use the same key for encryption and decryption. So uh, then we have the encryption algorithm, which takes as input the key k and a message m and outputs a ciphertext c. And then we want the decry decryption algorithm to take as input, excuse me, not the message, the ciphertext c and the key K and output a message M. So the way this is going to work is Alice and Bob are going to be here again. They have some pre-shared secret key K. They both know it's secret uh, only to them. And they're going to encrypt messages and send them to each other. So for example, Alice is going to encrypt uh, some message M. And then Bob, having the secret key K, is going to be able to decrypt the message. Right. Um, they can do this back and forth with the same shared secret key. And Charlie is going to, unfortunately, not be able to read the messages themselves. He's going to be reading the encryptions of the messages. An encryption scheme, generically, is supposed to be kind of like a cipher. It's going to be like something that makes it look random. Given uh, EK of M, it should be very difficult to find back M, perhaps even impossible. 
By very difficult, we mean there should be an insane amount of computational resources required in order for the adversary to, de to determine what M is, given the ciphertext. So M, EK of M, essentially looks like gibberish. Right? The only strategy the adversary should have to learn M, given the ciphertext, is simply to brute force search for the key. And that can take a very long time. So if the scheme is secure, the best thing they can do is brute force search for the key. And that's going to take them a long time. So we hope to say that the scheme, uh, the, the, uh, the scheme is secure. Right? This is how symmetric encryption works. Now, this is not like a general algorithm. This is just like a specification of what a symmetric encryption scheme should look like. I haven't described to you what E and D actually look like. Modern times, we would use the, uh, a symmetric en encryption scheme called AES. And AES, basically what it does is, is it like it takes the numbers, it moves them around, it XORs them across each other, it does some shifting left, some shifting right, it then does a lookup table, it does some kind of complicated stuff. It's some really, really, it's pretty fast though. It's a bunch of additions and XORs and shifts. And it's encoded usually today like in hardware, like every Intel AMD chip comes with uh, AES at the very circuit level. So you can do it AES extremely quickly. But this is how symmetric encryption is done. So Alice and Bob technically have their messages protected. But there's one small problem with every symmetric encryption scheme. Given the description of the protocols we've done it so far, what would be the first problem you would say exists? If you learn the key, then you can decrypt it. If you learn the key, you can decrypt it. Um, let's suppose that Alice and Bob have very good hard drives. So by the way, even the RSA we'll present today does have problems to when you get to the very security implementation level things. And we're just going to do sort of a high level description. It is true that if you learn the key that everything is oh, it's over. You know, it's totally it's totally gone for you. Um, there's a like a mission in Battlefield 1 where you have to like um, you like hijack a train or something and then you have to steal the code book, right? And then because you stole the code book, you know all past and future messages encrypted and decrypted. So if the adversary somehow learns the key K it's over. Just assume it's over. There's nothing really to prevent that, right? So yes, the key is sort of a, a gem. If you t if you steal the key, it's it's the the, the game is, is is lost. But there's another problem, and it doesn't re revolve around the key. Let's brainstorm a little bit. Let's see if we can see it. Let's see if you you can think of a problem with this. This is a problem that every symmetric encryption scheme has. Send the wrong message. I don't know. There's a, the, the, those are all, that would also be an issue. But I guess, I suppose the answer I'm looking for is nobody asked how did they get the key K? Both Alice and Bob have to know the same value. And let's say k is like 1,000 bits or something, whatever. They have to somehow agree upon and know a secret in advance. How do they do that? Well, the first thing they can't do is they cannot send the key to each other. Right? Because then the adversary would listen to the key. They're like, hey, here's my, here's my secret key. Use this to read all my messages. Well, then the adversary would also then know the key, and then the game is lost. So somehow they have to be able to agree on a key, K, without anyone else knowing what the key is. So they can't communicate with the, the they can't send the key over the internet. Now how is this done in like World War I again? You just meet up, you rendezvous, and then you make sure your books are aligned and all these things. So that's kind of difficult. We don't want to do that on the internet. We don't want, if you want to connect securely to Amazon.com, you shouldn't have to go there in person and agree on a secret key, and then you can go shop uh, securely. Um, here, Alice and Bob, we presented as two people, but you can also think of this as any client server thing. You, know? uh, you want to send your credit card information securely to Amazon in the way that whoever's operating the Wi-Fi network doesn't get to read your credit card info. right? So the secret channel is, is a very important thing. How do you set up this key K? This key K is a problem for every symmetric encryption scheme. Um, basically, RSA is the first ever, and perhaps maybe the only, really, uh, Asymmetric encryption scheme, because it's, it's still common, it's very used. An asymmetric encryption scheme, in some sense, solves this problem.
It's a tuple of algorithms, again, G, E, and D. And we'll talk about in detail how to implement this algorithm. Because we're not, we'll talk about what a symmetric encryption scheme is. Then we'll talk about how RSA actually implements it. Uh, the encryption scheme, uh, excuse me, the key generation algorithm, G, again, takes on input some randomness. But it outputs a pair of keys, P, K, and S, K. Right? Now, it's called asymmetric because the same keys won't be used for encryption and decryption. It'll be a different key used for each operation. The encryption algorithm takes as input the public key and a message, and it outputs a cipher C. The decryption algorithm of the secret key takes as input the secret key and takes as input an encrypted message using the same corresponding public key, and that outputs the message M. So here's the way the asymmetric encryption should work. There are a pair of keys. Each of them is mapped to each other. They are combined, right? They are, this is the corresponding public key, and the corresponding secret key. They only match with each other and no other public key, private key, secret key, whatever. You can decrypt any encrypted message with the secret key only if that secret key is the secret key that corresponds to that public key. The public keys are public. They are allowed to be shared. The secret keys will not be shared. So here's sort of the picture about how this works. Again, you have Alice and Bob. They, they both run a key generation algorithm. And they will output, for example, let's say Alice outputs a key. We'll call it PKA and SKA, right? So this is her public key and her private key. Bob also outputs, he runs a key generation algorithm, he outputs a public key B and a secret key B. Now, this, the public keys should be shared. So what they can do is they can both exchange public keys with each other. And learning the public key, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this later, should not help the bad guy. What happens in practice is a lot of times the public keys are also uploaded to a key server. Right? So you could say, I'm going to upload my key, public key to GitHub or whatever. You know, This is my public key. And then there, if you want to communicate with someone, you just go get the public key from the key server. You don't need to email them say, hey, send me your public key, whatever. Right? So the public keys are out there on the internet. Let's say. Let's say Bob wants to send a message to Alice. What he's going to do is use, uh, he's going to have some message M, and he's going to encrypt it with her public key. OK? He's going to encrypt it with her public key, and then he's going to send her the ciphertext C, right? Alice now knows this ciphertext C. She is going to decrypt it with her corresponding uh, secret key. And that's going to obtain the message M. Right? So what does the bad guy learn? The bad guy gets to know the following pieces of information. He learns all the public keys. Then he learns a, a message that has been encrypted with the public key. Right? But from this, we want it to be hard. No, he's bad. Yeah. We want it to be hard uh, or impossible to learn uh, M, right? He doesn't know the secret key, so he can't perform the decryption. The, way to th the best way to think about a public key, secret key system is that anyone can lock a box, but only those with the secret key can open the box. You know? Anyone can put a little envelope. Uh, out there, and then put that little lock on the envelope. That's encrypting something for someone. Anyone can do it on the internet. That's allowed. But only the person with the secret key can open the envelope back up. That's the way to think about public key encryption. right? So the bad guy sees the locked boxes, and he sees the keys that close the boxes. He doesn't have any of the keys that open the boxes. So we want it to be very, very hard impossible for the bad guy to learn the message, for the bad guy to open the box. You can only open the box if you have the secret key. Anyone can close the box. Only the person with the secret key can open the box. Right? 
Any questions on just what the problem that a public key encryption scheme solves so far on the on the, the method names and so on? The public uh, notice that there is no shared secret key problem. They don't have to rendezvous at midnight near a lamppost or anything to get to share some secret key. They are allowed to the public keys are allowed to be distributed, right? The secret key never leaves the hard drive. It's it's never touching the internet. It's always private, right? Questions on this so far? All right, let's describe how you actually implement um, public key cryptography. Now, public key cryptography, unfortunately, is not provably secure. It is conditionally secure. Basically, uh, for very complicated reasons, I'm gonna, this is not like perfectly accurate because I don't want to get into too much detail, but like if uh, P does not equal NP, then uh, public key uh, crypto exists. Um, we can't prove P does not equal NP. We, you don't, perhaps you only have a Vsauce level understanding of what that question even means. But basically, there's this really hard open question in computer science. We don't know how to solve it, but we have insurmountable evidence that it's true. And we know really how hard the problem is, but we can't solve it necessarily. But public key crypto only exists if P does not equal NP. Now, if someone were to show P equals NP, they could break every crypto system that we use today. Unfortunate. But the whole internet is reliant on this being true, unfortunately. Um, I used to work in cryptography, and eventually I got kind of uh, too curious about, like, why is this the case? Why do we think this? I mean, obviously, what if, what if it's false? You, it took 18 months of rigorous study to understand why complexity theorists believe things to be the way they are. And only after that was I satisfied, like, okay, fine, yeah. That's probably the case, you know. Um, we don't have time to explain why that's true. So all of cryptography, unfortunately, only has conditional security. Uh, it's crazy that that's the case, but that's sort of the way it is. Um, cryptographers have found a few what are called hardness assumptions. A hardness assumption is something you cannot prove to be hard. It is just you hope it's hard. Because if it's easy, maybe that says something about P does not equal NP. A hard, um, here's the hardness assumptions we want. Uh, factoring is like uh, if uh, N is equal to the product of two large primes, P, Q prime, and uh, P does not equal Q, then uh, computing on input n, you output a pair of the primes. This is hard. So basically, this is called factoring. Given a number, which is a product of two large primes, any algorithm that is able to factor it into the product of two primes is uh, hard. What do we mean by hard? You guys maybe have a little bit of understanding of an algorithm's runtime with respect to big O, right? An algorithm is said to be easy, essentially, if it's polynomial. An algorithm is said to be hard if it's not polynomial. So the best algorithms that we have for factoring are very, very difficult. They are better, they are much longer than polynomial. In fact, if you, for an average instance of this problem, um, you can only do like 800-bit numbers, right? It takes like 10 years of supercomputing time to factor an 800-bit number into the product of its two primes. So essentially, if you choose P and Q big enough, uh, anyone who factors, you could say something like this. Given that uh, P and Q are big enough, anyone who can factor P and Q has to use as much electricity as the sun outputs in 100 million years, and it'll take them 500 million years for the computers to finish running. You can do some back of the napkin math like that, and you basically hedge the security against that. Now, this also is not proven, though. We don't know that there is no faster algorithm, but we have strong evidence that there is no faster algorithm, and, but we can't prove it. So, any questions on that? I'll talk about one more. Um, uh, this is called the RSA assumption, and these are related. Basically, given, um, given y, given x to the y mod n, and given n, it's hard to compute 
x. It's called RSA. You, in another formula, this could be called, think of this like a discrete log. Okay? If I give you x to the y and you're working in the group of natural numbers or real numbers, whatever, you take the log of it is easy to compute. You just go to your calculator and you push the log button. It's simple. But unfortunately, when you're working mod n, it's not so simple. Because when you mod n, this essentially acts like a randomization. x to the y, if y is really big, basically could be any of the elements between 0 and n minus 1, right? It's just, it could be any of them. It looks random in some sense. So how do you unrandomize it? Uh, you can't really do it. So this is another hardness assumption, right? There are such hardness assumptions, and the two are related. There are such hardness assumptions that are really hard that we don't have evidence that they're easy. We have a lot of evidence that they're hard. We cannot prove it, you know? Um, Let's talk a little, bit, a, bit, a little bit more about factoring as a hardness assumption. I want to try to convince you that factoring is a hard problem. You may think, well, factoring is easy in general, because I've given you some numbers, and you've been able to decompose them into the product of its prime powers. So what, is 20, what are the factors of 24? What? 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, uh, 12, 24. Um, let's suppose we're computing the unique prime factorization. So let's ignore, let's ignore 1. So 2, 2 squared. Two cubed, eight goes into it, right? Does 16 go into it? No. So we'll do two cubed. Two cubed, eight times three is 24. Okay, so it's just two times three, two to the three times eight, right? Um, but if, so sometimes factoring is actually kind of easy. If you think about it, on an average case-ish, if I gave you a random looking number <laughs> and I said factor it for me, you could probably do it. Why? Well, there's a half chance that that random number has two as a factor. Right? It's easy to factor an even number. Just it's you divide by two and you factor it. You found a factor of it, right? So we choose not just like a general factoring to be hard, because it's not, but we choose this specific subproblem of factoring, which is that n is the product of two large primes, right? Here's the reason we do this. Do you recall we did this proof for, um, in, in the proof section on the contrapositive? We proved that if, uh, uh, if uh, n is equal to a, b, then uh, what is the size of its smaller factor? Do you get, does anyone remember this? Uh, this is just a trivia question. It's not super serious. We proved that if n is equal to a, b, then either a is less than or equal to square root of n, or b is less than or equal to square root of n. Let's reprove it real quick. But basically, this says that the smallest prime factor, or the smallest factor, in fact, of a number is really small. So you want the smallest factor to be not so small. That's sort of what, what happens here. Um, let's prove this in the contrapositive. If uh, a is greater than square root of n, b is greater than square root of n, then n does not equal a, b. Right? That's contrapositive of the statement. Uh, let's prove it. Uh, if a is greater than square root of n, b is greater than square root of n, then a times b is greater than square root of n times b, which is greater than square root of n times square root of n, which is equal to n. So a, b is greater than n, so a, b does not equal n. Right? One of its factors must be less than or equal to the square root of the number. Right? Now, consider instead of n equals a, b, suppose we did n equals a, b, c, n equals a, b, c, d, whatever. If it has 10 factors, the smallest one is going to be n equal to like n to the 1 over 10. It's going to be real small, right? So you want it to be the product of only two prime numbers and those prime numbers to be really, really big, close to each other and perhaps not too close. For example, if one of the prime numbers was 3, and the other one was 18,101, something like this, that is actually easy to factor because you know one of them is less than or equal to uh, the square root of n. One of them is, in fact, really, really small. It's just 3, right? So you can quickly check that it's 3. You can't quickly check that the, the prime factorization is easy when it's, when it's like that, right? Factorization being hard is actually a really interesting problem because all the other algorithms involving prime numbers seem to be really easy. GCD, extremely efficient. 
Um, primality testing. Given a, ran given a number, is it prime or not? Efficient. Um, all the other problems, div integer division, efficient. Uh, all these problems appear to be easy except factoring. Multiplication, in fact, is easy, right? That's sort of the reason we use this as a hardness assumption is because uh, computing given n, computing pq is hard, but going the other way is easy, actually. Given pq, computing n is really, really easy. How do you do it? Just multiply the two numbers together, right? So we're going to give this, set this up in such a way so, so that the good guys only have to do the easy work and then the bad guy has to do the hard work. That's the reason cryptography is it works. It's sort of one-way hardness in some sense, right? Any questions on this so far? Factorization? Right. So if computing f of n is equal to pq is hard, suppose uh, the following is also uh, hard. Uh, if uh, n is equal to pq, p times q, computing phi of n is also hard. What is phi of n for n is equal to p times q? Just to factor this out, this is equal to pq minus p minus q plus 1, right? So given, a, given n, it's actually hard to determine phi of n. That's, a, again, a hardness assumption. We can't prove it. It's hard, right? Because if you could factor it, you could easily just compute this, OK? This is just pq minus p plus q plus 1. So if you could determine pq, from pq, you could get p and q separately. You can just compute p plus q, and then you can finish computing uh, phi of n. But we don't think you can do this either. So factoring n, in fact, the only way we told you how to comp the formula for phi of n involved the prime factorization of it, right? So finding the prime factorization is difficult, so is computing phi of n, right? Convince yourself that computing phi of n is actually really hard, right? Questions on this so far? All right, let's get into the RSA uh, scheme. Right, so here's how it's going to work. Uh, Bob. Uh, randomly generates large primes p and q. Now he keeps these secret. He keeps these to himself. He doesn't tell anyone who those, what those large primes are. Um, then he computes uh, n is equal to p times q. And then he computes uh, phi of n, right? So because Bob already knows the factorization of n, he is doing it the easy way. He generates p, then he generates q, and then he computes n. He's not given n and then has to compute p and q. He computes p and q and then computes n. So he gets to do the easy problem. We hope that he does it in such a way that it will be hard for the adversary, given only n, to compute p and q separately. Right? Once he computes 5n, he chooses... Uh, Again, phi of n here is going to be p minus 1 times q minus 1. He's going to choose a number e randomly uh, such that um, e, that the GCD of e and phi of n is equal to 1. So he's going to choose some number e relatively prime to phi of n. Okay? Since e is relatively prime to phi of n, he then computes d, uh, which is equal to e inverse mod phi of n. So d is the multiplicative inverse of e mod not n, phi of n. d is the inverse of e mod phi of n, not n. 
right? How do you efficiently compute the multiplicative inverse? Anyone remember the algorithm name? You're going to use the extended Euclidean algorithm and Bayesian identity to compute the multiplicative inverse. If E and 5n are congruent to 1, then you know that there exists, here's a little digression, there exists S and T such that E, S plus 5n, T is equal to 1, right? So when you mod by, uh, if you mod this by 5n, then you know E, S is congruent to 1, mod 5n, right? So you know actually that s is equal to e inverse mod 5n. So what you'll do is you'll run the extended Euclidean algorithm. You'll find such s and t. And then whatever the s is, is your multiplicative inverse mod 5n. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because we have to make sure that the good guys only have easy work to do. This is easy for a computer to do. There's no brute force search. It's not exponential time, something weird, right? They only have to run extended Euclidean. And again, the computer is the one who's going to run the extended Euclidean algorithm. Uh, Bob is not going to do this with pen and paper, right? So this, but this is how the multiplicative inverse would be computed, right? Questions on that? Do we remember that part? Vaguely. Um, he computes D uh, is equal to E inverse. He sets the public key to be a struct of the number n and the encryption exponent e. So the public key is a pair of numbers. Somehow they're in a struct, or they're serialized or encoded in some way, so that it's the tuple. It's n and e, right? Then he's going to set the secret key simply to be uh, d and nothing else. It's just going to be d by itself. This is how the key generation for Bob works. So Bob then is going to send Alice a message of the public key. The public key is equal to n and e, right? So he sends Alice n and e, right? Question so far? Okay. Uh, Alice has n and e is going to compute the ciphertext C is equal to m to the e mod n. So Alice has e. Alice has capital N. Alice has her message M, which is just some message coordinates of a bombing location, whatever. It's just a, it's your credit card info, who cares? She computes M to the E mod N and sets that to the ciphertext C. Okay? Then she replies to Bob with the ciphertext C. Okay. Bob, having ciphertext C and public key, excuse me, secret key D, he's going to compute C to the D mod N. Okay? C to the D mod N, we will prove is equal to M. We want to prove that C to the D will be equal to M. We'll prove the correctness of the algorithm. Well, this is how RSA works. We need to justify it in two ways. Yes? Is it C to the D mod N, like only D is being modded, or is it the entire thing? Sorry, it is on the ground. It's C to the D mod N, right? C to the D mod N. And again, uh, sort of mentioned there, when you raise something to a power, modular arithmetic, when, you raise, when you're not mo doing modular arithmetic, you raise something to a power, it gets really, really big, right? But when you raise something to a power mod n, and let's say the exponent is like really big, and then the modulus is kind of medium sized, maybe small, it looks random. It looks like it could be any of the things. It's not really like, oh, it's so much bigger. It's, it, it could, it's as if you're rolling, you know, like one of those, uh, roulette tables, right? If you roll the marble, you can't, and if you know it goes around it 25 times, it doesn't really tell you which number it's going to land on, right? Even if you know it's like 25 times bigger, that doesn't help because you're modding it. So in some sense, m to the e looks random. So we need to justify two things. First, we need to justify the algorithm is correct, that Bob does learn the message m, and that there is no mistake. Then we need to justify 
that um, the adversary doesn't learn anything. Those are the only two things we need to do, and then RSA is correct as far as we can prove as uh, theor theoreticians. You know, it's conditionally secure. Um, let's prove first that the message is correct. Probably fit in here. Right. So Bob learns C to the D mod N. Actually, we need two things. Before I get into that, before I get into the pr proof of correctness, we need two facts. Okay. The two facts are we know that E and D are multiplicative inverses of each other mod phi of N. Right? So we know that there exists some k such that e times d is equal to k phi of n plus 1. Right? Let's convince ourselves of that for a second. Since e and d are multiplicative inverses of each other, e times d is congruent to 1 mod phi of n. So there is some k such that e d is equal to k phi of n plus 1. Anyone disagree with that statement? Anyone not understand that one? Convince yourselves that's true by the fact that E and D are multiple inverses of each other. Next, uh, does anyone remember the statement of Euler's theorem? Uh, GCD A and uh, N is one uh, if and only if A, a uh, inverse exists. A inverses exist. Mod N. That is necessary, but it's actually not Euler's theorem st statement. It is A to the phi of N is congruent to 1 mod N. That's Euler's theorem. Right? Actually, you can use Euler's theorem to find an inverse. I uh, discovered this last night on the internet. If you know a to the phi of n is congruent to 1 mod n, you actually know that a times a to the phi of n minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod n. You agree? So actually, a inverse is congruent to a to the phi of n minus 1 mod n. You can use Euler's theorem to compute an inverse. Uh, kind of interesting. Not how inverses should be computed. This is actually very slow. So this is just a, like a fun fact and not something useful. But we will need uh, this fact. We will need Euler's theorem to, to prove the correctness, right? So we want to prove that c to the d mod n is equal to m. So we know that we start with c. Bob computes c to the d mod n. And c was computed to be m to the e mod n, right? But by simple math, we know that this is just m to the e d mod n, right? So we know actually that m to the ed is, is uh, m to the ed mod n is just the ciphertext c. We also know that there exists some k such that ed is equal to k times phi of n plus one. So we will substitute that in. We'll get m to the k phi of n plus one mod n. Let's do some more math. We get m to the k phi of n, m, mod n. Simple arithmetic so far. Any disagreements? Um, let's, let's rewrite m to the k phi of n as m to the phi of n to the k, m, mod n. What is that? That is just m to the phi of n, if the GCD of m and n is equal to 1, then m to the phi of n is equal to 1. It's congruent to 1, mod n, right? 
by Euler's theorem. So we know that this is then just equal to 1 to the k m mod n, which is just congruent to m mod n. QED. Right? So we did prove that c to the d mod n is congruent to m mod n. There is one question you should ask about this, though. There's one step we sort of missed. There's one thing unclarified. Question? Uh, how is ED equals to k 5 n plus 1? ED is equal to k 5 n plus 1 because a D is computed to be the inverse of E mod uh, 5n. So we know that E times D is congruent to 1 mod 5n. So we know that uh, there exists some k such that E D is equal to 5n k plus 1. By the rules of modular arithmetic, right? Yes? Is a 5n k equals 0? Yes. When you mod by n, that goes back to 0. Exactly. Um, questions? There's one part here we didn't really justify, which was the fact that if the GCD of m and capital N is equal to 1, then we get to apply Euler's theorem. But that's not necessarily true. n is going to be a product of two primes. M is just any arbitrary message that Alice has for Bob, right? So why do we get to assume that GCD of MN is 1, right? Well, consider that the GC, consider what, what, what happens if that's not true. We have GCD of the message and the modulus is equal to 1. But this is really the GCD of M and PQ, right? If you know the GCD of two numbers uh, and one of the numbers is a product of two primes, what is the possible values? of the uh, GCD, right? Uh, this is going to be some number D, such that D divides into M and D divides into P times Q. So uh, D is equal to 1. It's equal to P. It's equal to Q. Or it's equal to P times Q, right? Those are the only possible values for D. What that means is that D, that M somehow was a, um, it accidentally was a prime factor. Again, M is like an English sentence. M is a message, a text, plain text message that is then converted into an bits. It's converted into its bits. And then that, those bits are then converted into a number, right? So that's how an, a, a text is converted to a number so you can then exponentiate and encrypt it. But what's the chance that Alice types a message out that happens to guess the modulus, right? The chance this, this happens is basically none. This will basically never, ever happen. If this happens, that basically means Alice was able to guess the factorization, which shouldn't happen anyway by the hardness assumption. So the case that the GCD of M and PQ is, D is not 1 never happens, essentially. If you generate a random English sentence, what's the chance that it uh, um, is one of the secrets that are supposed to be kept secret? That should be basically impossible, right? So we never even consider that case. Questions? OK. So convince yourself that we've proven that the output of the algorithm is correct. Now we just need to show that the adversary doesn't learn anything. I'm going to leave the uh, hardness assumptions up. But let's talk about um, what, does the, what is the view of Charlie. Charlie is an eavesdropper. He listens to all the messages going on. He learns the following values. He learns he learns the public key, which is equal to n and e. He also learns m to the e mod n, right? So what does uh, the bad guy listen to? He knows n, he knows e, and he knows m to the e 
oh, excuse me, m to the e mod n. And based on our hardness assumption, it's basically impossible to compute, uh, compute uh, m. Given n, e, and m to the e mod n, it's, impo it's not impossible, but it's extremely, re extremely hard for him. As in, it'll take 500 years of your computer being on, even if you assume the CPUs double every 18 months. It's basically impossible for him to uh, uh, br brute force this, this thing. Now, we, again, we can't prove that the hardness assumption is tr true. We can only assume it's hard, because we have a lot of evidence that it's hard. Uh, and that's the best we can do for all public key cryptography, right? Instead of sh proving that it's too hard, I'll prove the reverse. What I'm going to show is like, um, if factoring is easy, then RSA is insecure. So by insecure, we mean that an adversary, or an eavesdropper, can listen in and decrypt the messages, right? So let's suppose that factoring is easy. So if factoring is easy, then here's what Charlie does. He has n, he has e, and he has m to the e mod n. He takes n and he decomposes it into p and q separately. And this is by the assumption that factorization is easy. Okay. Then he computes uh, phi of n as just p minus 1 times q minus 1. Right? Because he knows what uh, it is. Uh, then, since he knows phi of n, he uses extended Euclidean algorithm to compute a d, which is congruent to e inverse mod phi of n. Right? So once you have phi of n, the game is up, because from there you may compute the inverse easily. Right? He knows the public key, and... The public, from the public key, it's hard to get the secret key unless you can factor. But if you can factor, you can get the, you can get the secret key. From here, what should Bob do to learn the message? Excuse me, what should Charlie do to learn the message? He was able to learn the secret key, D. What's the last step he should do? Sorry, what? D equals C. D equals C? Decode. Yes. So we'll put C, which is equal to m to the e mod n, and he'll raise this to the power uh, D. So computes uh, C to the D mod n, which is just equal to m, as we know. So from there, he can learn the message. If he can factor, he can learn the message. If he, we can't prove it, but if he can't factor, we hope he can't learn the message, right? RSA is conditionally secure, okay? One last comment on um, how this works in the real world is, well, before we do that, any questions on the, on the adversaries side, why we think this is hard? Right, so in the real world, um, it's really expensive for computers to do exponentiation, right? Like, symmetric encryption is really, really fast. It's just a bunch of bitwise operations. And it, computing RSA is kind of difficult because you have to do this exponentiation. And for big enough M and E and N, this is actually really expensive. It takes really a long time to do this. And every time you want to send a message, you have to do that. So what actually happens is, to speed things up, is that RSA is used to share one secret key, and that secret key is then used as a session key for symmetric encryption. So recall we did symmetric encryption. We, they had to have uh, some shared secret key K, right? So what they do in practice is instead of resending you redoing RSA for each message, they do RSA one time to share a long secret key, and then they do AES with it uh, for the secret key. So um, they use 
asymmetric encryption to, to solve the key sharing problem, and then they use normal encryption that's hard for other reasons to uh, do the message exchanging, right? And then that works in hardware because your CPU has that implemented. It's very fast. That's, that way you don't have to do uh, exponentiation every time you want to send one bit of a message securely, right? That's, how, that's uh, uh, when it's occurring, right? Questions on RSA? Yes. So uh, the, like if you do random like shifts and additions and subtractions, that would be something that you could brute force easily? Great question. And so basically what happens, the way this, the, it, 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 we can't prove this either, but there's something called these like NIST standardization efforts. What actually happens is they hold a contest. All right, guys, go design a public key, excuse me, a symmetric key cipher, and then whichever one is the best, we'll certify it. So it's like a contest, different schools, even some at Georgia Tech have done this. They, pu they publish a, a specification of an algorithm, which is a symmetric cipher. And they say, this one is this secure, this one is this secure. And basically, people try to break each other's. This process takes months and months. And then certain candidates are eliminated because, oh, actually, if you encrypt zero with yours, it always is zero, something like this. you know. Or this one is slightly faster than this one, something like this. right? And basically, after this, lots and lots of heuristics and statistical testing, a candidate emerges that appears to be the strongest. And for example, that one occurred in the early 2000s was AES. That's the reason we use AES. Given AES, it's really difficult to go backwards. Like if I told you it was shifts and flips and inverts, you think, well, I'm just going to subtract one, and then I'm going to do the on XOR. And it, like if given a description of the algorithm, it sounds like, well, I could just try to invert it. But if I actually gave you the description of AES, I would encourage you to try to invert it. And you'll quickly get stuck on going backwards. It's really difficult to go backwards uh, for AES. We can't prove it, though. We have no way of proving that this is a hard function. But there's insurmountable evidence that it's hard. No one knows how to break it, right? And then let's say you break it a little bit. All you do is run it twice, something like this. You know what I mean? So um, these things work in practice, even if the theory, we don't know how to say it. We don't know how to prove this is hard. We can't prove hardness unconditionally. But we hope it's hard, and then we just, it, it works. The internet is reliant on this being true, and, we're, and there's billions and billions of dollars uh, at stake, and hackers are always looking at this stuff all the time, and none of them have figured it out yet. So it's probably impossible. Can't prove it, though, mathematically. We just hope so. Does that answer your question? All right. Any more questions on RSA? Yes. Explain that statement right behind you with the GCD of the M and N equal one at the bottom. Yes, that is Euler's uh, theorem. If the GCD of A and N is one, then A to the five N is congruent to one mod N. This was the generalization of Fermat's theorem. So we have here M to the five N to the K times M is congruent to M mod N. So if the GCD of M and N is one, then we know M to the five N is congruent to one mod N. Right? Don't think of this as something to the k. Think of this as m to the 5n times m to the 5n times n to the 5n times n to the 5n. Right? So it's 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, which is just 1. Right? But that only is true if these are relatively prime. But because we chose a semi-prime, product of two large primes, it's never, this has never happened in history, the case that they're not prime. So it's OK to just say that let them be relatively prime. Right? m is an English sentence, but it's also padded with some randomness to make it long enough. Right? You don't want it to be. There are all other kinds of problems with vanilla RSA. Like if m is a single bit, if m is 0, you can't encrypt a 0, because 0 to the anything is 0, right? So uh, you pad it with some randomness. You make sure it's long enough and things like this, right? Statistical attacks. Um, if you know, for example, you're doing voting, you only know if, this, uh, if you can count the number of encryptions. If it's 40% look like one type and 60% look like the other type, you can learn something about that even if you don't know what the decryption is itself, something like this. So there's all kinds of other slight problems that take a whole computer science degree and course to understand how to fix RSA. But this is the reason. This is like all the internet is based on. In fact, if you go to a website and you click the, the key, and then you click like advanced view, more settings, whatever, it'll just show you n. It'll show you what the n is. It'll show you what e is supposed to be. It still does this today. RSA is still used. That's how the internet works. Right. More questions on this? Yes. Is that m? Supposed to be like less than n. Yeah, you could choose m because because Bob doesn't want to learn m mod n. He wants to learn whatever m was. But in practice, n is huge. It's like eight hundred bits. So then that means that it's mod two to the eight eight hundred bits. So he can in practice it doesn't that doesn't 
do anything to the message. It only does things to the encryption, right? Only when you compute m to the e to get it big enough does it roll over the mod. Before that, m is usually like a small English sentence. n is really big. So that usually never occurs in practice either. But yeah, m, suppose that um, at the key generation step, Alice is like, oh, I can only send a message less than n. Something like this, right? So more questions on RSA? Excellent. Yeah, oh, yes. One more time about the C C C D of M and N uh, different than one. Right. So we want to apply Euler's theorem in order to conclude that it's M. Because notice that when we get to apply Euler's theorem, we get to here. That one is this M to the 5N, right? So we want that to be one so that we can conclude that it's just M, right? We want the output of Bob to be m. So we need GCD of m and n to be 1, right? Now, we don't actually know if it's 1 or not. But with high probability, like as in you have a greater chance of getting hit by lightning times like a million than this ever happening, right? There's always one attack that every bad guy can do, which is just to guess the key. Suppose he gets really, really lucky and he guesses the key. So it, like replace this brute force or whatever factorization with just, I'm just going to guess and check for all possible values of D. There are too many. It's exponential time to do that. So we don't, so we say, okay, you can keep trying that, but you know, you will die before you finish. That's sort of what the security is hedged against. And the same thing here, the probability that uh, an honest message by M ends up being not relatively prime to N has no chance of happening. Because that basically means they guessed the prime factorization. They have a greater chance of being hit by lightning a million times in a row. Right? Now, does this happen theoretically? Yes. Does it happen in practice? No. This is not a number theory statement. This is like an algorithms statement. You can assume that m and n are relatively prime. Does that answer your question? More questions? Excellent.